Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this special program on the opiate crisis. I would like to introduce Tom Ross, the president of the Palm Beach Business Group. Tom, pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for coming, and uh, welcome all you people who have an opportunity to see this event tonight. Good evening. I'm Dave Ehrenberg. I'm state attorney for Palm Beach County. There are 20 of us in the state of Florida. We all have a district, a circuit, and our circuit is just the county because Palm Beach County is so large. Uh, and the best part about this job is that we're all independent. The governor is not my boss. The attorney general, although we work well together, not my boss. The people are my boss. So I'm beholden to uh, the people of Palm Beach County and my own conscience. And we get to set our own priorities. And in this county, we are ground zero when it comes to the fight against opioid abuse. There are other counties in the country, in other states, especially in Appalachia, where there's a higher rate of deaths from opioids. But no other county has more drug treatment centers. And that is a key in understanding why the opioid epidemic has gotten so bad. It's because of federal laws that have exacerbated the problem, federal laws that are intended to help when in reality they're being misused, exploited by some bad people to take advantage of those in recovery. So why recently have you seen such a spike in opioid abuse? Well, in part, you can blame it on the fact that federal laws, the Affordable Care Act, well-intended, the Americans with Disabilities Act, well-intended, are being exploited. So now you have a new pot of money to help addicts who need insurance to go through rehab, but what has happened is the incentives create an incentive for relapse rather than recovery. We have a model of relapse rather than sobriety, and this is going to continue until the federal government fixes the incentives in federal law that give more money to the bad treatment providers, the rogue providers, rather than the good guys. This is like the old days of uh, before the welfare system was, was corrected, where you used to get more money per child. Well, nowadays, you get more money if you're a drug treatment center who fails over and over again. If you give illegal benefits, you get the patients. Meanwhile, the good guys who do it right, who don't pay illegal benefits, uh, who don't participate in patient brokering, who are succeeding at higher rates, their money is drying up while the bad guys thrive in this environment. And as far as the Americans with Disabilities Act, an act designed to protect people who are disabled, including people who are battling addiction, those individuals um, who are taking advantage of people with addiction, who are opening up rogue sober homes, which are nothing more than flop houses, where people go there to live in a group setting and get taken advantage of through drug abuse, human trafficking, forced theft. Uh, there, was a, there was a sober home where the owner of the sober home forced his female uh, residents to either perform sex acts for money or to steal from Worth Avenue. And those homes, those sober homes, and some of them are good, others not so much, but they're all protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act. An act designed to protect people with disabilities is now being used to shield those who would do them harm the owners of rogue sober homes. So when local governments like the town of Palm Beach wants to regulate sober homes, they're largely unable to because the Americans with Disabilities Act prevents them from doing so. The city of Boca Raton enacted some pretty tough guidelines a few years ago. They were sued and lost and had to pay out $3 million. So very few other cities want to go down that road until the federal government issues a clarification under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act. How far can local governments go to regulate sober homes in the community? Well, last year the federal government did issue a clarification, but as you can expect, it came from the federal government, so it was not very clarifying. <laughs> the, cl the clarification only allowed us to prevent a over-congregation of sober homes on one block in one particular area, but it said nothing about doing any other registration, certification, inspections any other regulations. And that's where we are now. Federal laws that are intended to help people in recovery are doing them harm. And so that's where this presentation comes from. You see on the left, that was the old days, the pill mill days. Remember those days? 
I'm old enough to remember 2011, right? 2010, we finally got tough in 2011 and passed new laws and helped get rid of those pill mills in the community. And as a result, an unintended consequence, which we knew was going to happen, was that people moved to heroin, which is an opiate just like oxycodone. It acts the same way in your brain. But once we made this one harder to get and much more expensive, this became a very viable alternative. And this is not your father's heroin anymore. This is heroin that can be snorted and smoked. It can be packed in a pill. It looks like a pill sometimes. It used to be the drug where you'd see junkies under a bridge do it. Nowadays, it cuts across every socioeconomic group. It is touching everyone's lives. 2005, you may have uh, seen that some, some people you knew back in the high school who were sort of like the dropouts, all of a sudden were driving around in uh, fancy cars. You know, that guy who used to say, would never amount to anything in high school, was driving around in their Ferrari, and you'd ask him, How'd you get that Ferrari? And he said, oh, I'm a mortgage broker. Remember those days? And the crash happened five years later. You saw that same guy with a fancy car. He said, he said well, how'd you get that car? I own pain clinics. <laughs> five years later, we shut them down now. I own drug rehab centers and sober homes. Now to make matters clear, so there's no confusing what I'm saying. There are good players in the industry. We need them. They are very helpful to us. They have helped us clean up the industry here in Palm Beach County and made us a national leader in this fight. But they are also being hurt by the bad guys in the industry who take away their patients, who give the whole industry a bad name. And so when I talk about rogue sober homes, I'm meaning the bad players in the industry. When I'm talking about treatment centers, I'm talking about the bad players who are unscrupulous actors doing people harm, not the good guys out there. And we have some people involved with good uh, companies here tonight. So in theory, this is what is the Florida model. It's what's supposed to happen. You have someone usually from out of state. This is a substance use disorder patient. That's the terminology that's common these days. Uh, instead of addict, you say you have substance use disorder. 75% of people who are in our drug treatment centers here, paid for by private insurance, 75% of them come from out of state. So they are brought down here and they go into an inpatient treatment center. Now, it was said by the excellent speaker before me that the decision on how many days you get inpatient treatment and detox, this is not done by doctors anymore. It's done by actuaries. It's done by insurance execs. And so now you get it depends, maybe 10 days of inpatient treatment. It depends on your insurance. Maybe you can get seven days of detox. Used to be much more, but the fraud and abuse in the industry has, has turned the spigot off largely. But you get 10 days, you go in there for inpatient treatment. Then what happens when you get out? You go to outpatient care. These are just acronyms for different types of outpatient care, intensive outpatient care, uh, partial hospitalization, outpatient care. This is the kind of stuff the insurance will pay about four weeks of. But where do you live? They don't have housing. So you live in a sober home. I've done a background check on everyone here. <laughs> and I can say that all of you can open up a sober home today. Not tomorrow, today. Now you're wondering, what kind of background check did I do? Nothing. <laughs> I didn't do anything. What kind of regulations do you need? What kind of paperwork do you need to fill out to open up a sober home? What would that be? Nothing. Just do it. Turn your own home into a sober home. And when the town of Palm Beach says, you can't put nine unrelated people in your three-bedroom house, you then respond, yes, I request a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act because my residents are going through recovery and they're covered under the act. And the lawyer for the town of Palm Beach will say, welcome to our community. Okay? And... The residents and neighbors will blame the mayor and the city council, but they're not at fault. Talk to your members of Congress. Now, look, we need good sober homes. The best sober homes are the ones that you don't even know are there. But then others are flop houses, protected by the same law designed to protect individuals in recovery. Instead, they're living there and getting involved with human trafficking and drugs and other crimes and destroying communities. We're talking about the bad ones here. So you live there. By the way, uh, one reason why there's no regulations is there's no treatment here. There's no treatment. It's just a house. That's why you can open up one today. 
The treatment is here. You just live here. But you can't live here, so you live here. Insurance doesn't pay for this. They pay for this. They pay for this. So the thing is, after you're done with your outpatient care, hopefully you're sober and you go back home to Michigan or wherever you come from, and that's the Florida model in theory. But in practice, it's really the Florida shuffle. You start with an out-of-state patient, usually out-of-state, could be local, but generally chances are they're out-of-state. They see a TV ad, a web ad, they call the phone number and they get diagnosed. By diagnosed, I mean a marketer tells them where to go. And the marketer is a trained doctor who will prescribe you the right treatment plan and get you to the right facility. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no. It's a guy getting paid money. The more patients he gets to his facility who's paying him, and he gets a kickback. That's it. And so what do you get in return? You get a free plane ticket. Come on down to Florida. Get the next plane. We're sending you a ticket. Wow. That's illegal, by the way. That's patient brokering. It's a third-degree felony. The good players don't do that but try competing against others who do. Which, if you're an addict and one treatment center offers you a free plane ticket to Delray Beach and the other one says you gotta get down here on your own, who are you gonna use? So you come down here, you go in there, your insurance will cover you under the Affordable Care Act. If you don't have it, you'll get it under the exchanges and then you'll get sent to an outpatient care and how will you find that place? It will be because the marketer will send you there and again, more kickbacks. And then you'll go to a sober home, more kickbacks. The labs will get their share. It's not a coincidence the labs are in yellow here, by the way. It's a very lucrative business. Your analysis is very lucrative business. The only one bubble up there that has no money attached to it is sobriety. We are incentivizing failure. The big money is not in sobriety. It's in relapse. And this is the Florida shuffle. And this is what needs to change because we can't fix this on our own. We can't fix this when the federal government's policies are continuing to create more an influx of more and more people who then get caught up in this. And the victims are too often willing victims because they have a, the disease of addiction. Their brain has changed. And when they get all these benefits, you know, it's hard enough to remain sober as it is, let alone knowing that your sobriety is going to cost you your free home, your friends, your free transportation, your free illegal gifts. And now you got to move back home to New Hampshire, live with your parents, and find a job. Or you can test dirty again, and the drug dealers know where the sober homes are. Sometimes it, they're inside the sober home. And you test dirty, and then that cycle begins anew. And there's no limit to how many times you can go through this process. No limitation. And so in response, we have created this sober home task force. We've made... 40 arrests, 13 have been convicted. So we have been a national leader in this fight. No other county has this. But of course, no other county has as many drug treatment centers as we do. But as we are shutting down the rogue sober homes and rogue treatment centers, we are seeing that the ones who are remaining are deciding to pack up and go elsewhere in Florida, around the country, where they're less prepared for this. So we have made a real dent. Last month in Delray Beach, where most of these facilities are, they had a dramatic drop uh, in the number of opioid deaths. A dramatic drop. Uh, but we're starting to see it go elsewhere, and we have started to train prosecutors from throughout the state and hopefully throughout the country. I have a conference call on Friday with prosecutors from around the country on this. So we are doing our part, and we are leading the way in Palm Beach County. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening today. I hope that the next time that I speak to the group, we'll have good news that Palm Beach County will have led the way for the rest of the country to actually make a dent in this fight. And hopefully Congress will do more than listen because they listen to us, that they'll actually act and change our laws. So thank you very much. With us now, Estate Attorney Dave Allenberg. A real pleasure to have you back on the show. Great to be back, Richard. Thank you. I just attended this event, and your lecture was superb, phenomenal. So please just headline it for our audience. Well, thank you for saying that. I was discussing the opioid epidemic, in particular, what 
federal laws have unintentionally created, which is exacerbating this problem. Well-intentioned federal laws, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Affordable Care Act, all well-intentioned, have been misused by some unscrupulous actors to take advantage of people in recovery. So ironically and sadly, the people designed to be protected and assisted by these laws are being led to their demise by some who are taking advantage of them. How is it possible that in our society today such transgressions are possible? Well, it's just unintentional uh, activity here where you have uh, a d law like the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, a law designed to help people has been misused by others who are taking advantage of people in recovery, opening up sober homes, and instead of having a real recovery residence, has turned this home into a flop house. And under the ADA and the Fair Housing Act, the, fed the local governments are largely preempted from regulating, registering, inspecting these homes. So ironically, the very law that is designed to protect people in recovery has been misused to shield those who would do them harm. How can our society, again, I must ask, tolerate such practices? Well, you know, we, we can't. We've got to appeal to our federal officials to try to clarify or tweak the federal laws to make sure the proper incentives are in place, such as when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, we need to make sure that you have outcome-based reimbursement where the good providers are being paid more and the bad providers are paid less. Right now, the incentives are for relapse, not recovery. There's no money in sobriety. And so we're stuck at the local level trying to pick up the pieces, making arrests, trying to shut down rogue sober homes and corrupted drug treatment centers. And there are good ones, but we have seen too many bad ones. And we are shutting them down and making arrests. Uh, and we're seeing uh, some members of the industry go elsewhere. This is a problem that is affecting everyone. As we shut down a number of these places, we see others moving to other parts of the state and country. And so we're trying to train law enforcement officials from all over to, to be able to deal with this properly. It's nearly inconceivable. No profit in sobriety. Astonishing. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, there are good providers out there, and they do things the right way, but they're being undermined by the bad providers who are stealing their clients, their patients, through illegal benefits, free plane tickets to come down to South Florida, which is illegal. Uh, they have deceptive advertising. They provide them with drugs to keep them in the system sometimes and have an unlimited number of relapses that pays off, unfortunately. But it doesn't pay off for the individual in recovery who then leaves Florida in an ambulance or a body bag. You've been working on this cause for many years. In our last interview, we discussed this. Is the matter getting worse? Well, and being in Palm Beach County, it's it's improving because our task force has really turned the corner and been able to make 43 arrests in the past year and has shut down other facilities and, and prompted other wrongdoers to move out of town. And I think in Palm Beach County, you're starting to see real progress. In Delray Beach alone last month, they had a record drop in the number of opioid deaths. And so we're seeing real signs of progress. But what bothers me, what troubles me, is that you're seeing a number of these facilities move to other communities that are less prepared for this outside of Palm Beach County, and we're all in this together. So I would like to eradicate this menace, the fraud and abuse within the drug treatment industry, so that we have a vibrant, ethical industry left to get people off of uh, these dangerous drugs, because we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. We need good, reliable, honest drug treatment providers, and there are some. There are. They're in our midst, but they are being overshadowed by the bad in the industry uh, that has unfortunately corrupted, in the, in, corrupted the industry. Is the situation getting worse nationally, or is it just stagnantly staying the same? Well, which part, the fraud and abuse or the drug overdoses? I mean, you're seeing more drug overdoses overall throughout the country each year, but you're seeing at least the fraud and abuse it, anecdotally starting to dissipate here in Palm Beach County. I think you're seeing that what's left within the recovery industry are a lot of good providers who are making a difference, but uh, there are still enough bad providers out there that's giving the whole industry a bad name. What about human trafficking? You know, this is an issue we hear a lot about from the community. There's a real concern about individuals getting trafficked, either sex trafficking or labor trafficking. This is modern-day slavery. And what people are surprised to learn 
that most of the individuals being trafficked are homegrown. They're runaways from our community, not necessarily immigrants from other places. And you see people being lured into a life of prostitution, drugs, and forced labor right here amongst us. So we have tough laws in Florida to get at this problem, but we need victims to speak up. And if they won't speak up, we need good people like the people watching this today to say something if they see something. If you think someone is a victim of human trafficking, they need to report it to local law enforcement. Law enforcement across the country are being trained in this area because it's a matter of great public concern. But silence is the enemy. We can only do so much when you have so few individuals willing to speak up. Sir, you've been active in so many other areas as well, including Holocaust remembrance and advocating for rights in so many other areas. And you're highly admired and respected. Some people are rumoring that you're going to be ending up in a higher office. So what are your thoughts with regard to that question? Well, I love my job right now. I really do. You never know what the future holds, but it's got to be the right fit because right now I think I can have a real impact upon our community and saving lives from this opioid epidemic. And I just hate to leave fighting this opioid epidemic when there's so much more to do. Uh, it would have to be anything higher would have to be a really good fit where it enables me to to save lives and continue the work that I'm doing now. Uh, but I appreciate your nice words uh, because I love this job so much. Every day you get to wake up and stand up for victims of crime and fight for justice. And you know, there's not many jobs in government where you can do that. So I'm very fortunate to be where I am. One of our common friends, Bill Falloon, the publisher and actually founder of uh, Life Extension, just wrote this article, Shocking Facts Behind Today's opioid crisis, and this just appeared this month. Thank you. I, I'd like to take a look at that. I'm always uh, trying to read up. There's all, you know, you think you know everything about an issue, but then you realize you don't because uh, this issue, this area is ever evolving and uh, still a lot that I need to learn. By the way, uh, Bill, when I talked to him last, he suggested that uh, the easiest thing you can do that you can take as far as a supplement to uh, for longevity was vitamin D. So I've been taking vitamin D every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I take Coke, Enzyme Q10 and other things. Thank you again so very much. Thank you.